Welcome into the Wiltfong Whip Around with Steve Wiltfong. Today's Thursday, August 8th. I'm your host, Josh Newberg, and we're back at it with a lot to cover today. I'm excited about the show we're about to put on, but first, you guys hit subscribe. No, we're not going to say hit subscribe today. Today, I want to offer you something. On3 is available right now for $1. Have you been considering joining, kind of on the fence about it? Now is the time. On3 for just a buck. The On3 Recruits channel, we're always going to be free here on YouTube. But if you want to step your game up, college football season right around the corner, you can get On3 for just $1. Use code FONG1. That's Fong1 for this exclusive deal for Wilt Fong Whip Around viewers. Step your game up. Sign up for On3 for just a buck. Let's bring on my guy, Steve Wilt Fong. All right, we're going to get right into it. Texas A&M in Texas are going at it. They're throwing haymakers on the recruiting trail. Some big decisions went down recently, and, and both teams have come out on top. Longhorns, they land five-star Kalik Lockett. The Aggies on the seventh, they land top 100 defensive lineman DJ Sanders. So right now, we got two big battles brewing this August between these two in-state teams. We're talking Jonah Williams and Michael Fasusi. Some pivotal showdowns coming down. Break it down for us, Steve. Yeah, with Jonah Williams, number one safety in the country, there's been a lot of recent buzz around the Texas Longhorns and LSU Tigers. Texas got the last visit. I was on the inside scoop with you yesterday and talked about how I like where Texas is positioned, but as I continue to make calls, continue to shake trees, Texas a and still in that one. That's where my on three RPM is. He continues yeah. to have good dialogue with people in the building. And so while maybe we've seen some momentum ebb and flow with some schools, we're not going to rule out Texas A&M for Jonah Williams as things stand right now. And Michael Fasusi is one of the more heated recruiting battles on the trail right now. You got Texas, you got Texas A&M, and you have Oklahoma battling down the stretch. And I could see him end up at any of those three programs. And Texas and Texas A&M, just like the Sooners, pouring a lot into this one. So the, the Longhorns and Aggies going to be renewing their battle on the field. They're still getting after each other on the recruiting trail. And those are two exciting in-state battles. We talked about what a month it could be for Texas on the trail here in August. Well, as the Aggies are trying to work on a top 10 recruiting class themselves, they could hit, hit big in this month as well with guys like Jonah Williams and Michael Fasusi. Yeah. You know, I feel like we talk a whole lot about the Texas Longhorns on this channel, but it's the Aggies right now that are head in the recruiting rankings. Texas A&M sitting there at number seven. Texas Longhorns, even after the addition of five-star Kalik Lockett, at number 13. Uh, Steve, in Mike Elko's first year in Texas A&M, do you think it's possible that they could out-recruit Texas in this 2025 cycle? Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about Texas and some five stars that they're going to continue to recruit. Riley Pettijan, linebacker from in-state, one of the most coveted second-level defenders in the land. Texas isn't going to go away there. Neither is A&M. The Aggies are going to work to get him on campus. Jerome Miles is a blue-chip receiver from Utah that Texas a and is trying to get to their opener against Notre Dame. That uh, we've, we've talked a lot about the Miami-Florida game that's opening the season and what kind of blue chippers are going to be there, all the elite prospects from that part of the country. Well, the Texas A&M-Notre Dame game is going to be similar for the recruiting classes of 2025, 2026, and 2027 when the Mike Elko era opens up at Kyle Field at night in primetime with game day there in front of a bunch of recruits as well. Mm, yeah. All right, Texas – in-state Texas fans, whether you're an Aggie or a Longhorn, tap in. Let us know who do you think is going to be the best recruiting program in the state of Texas in 2025. Let us know. Comment section below. All right. Let's talk some quarterback drama. We got Julian Lewis. We got Houston Longstreet. We got Deuce Knight. Everybody's thinking about flipping. Now, let's let's com kind of compartmentalize this. You wrote about Longstreet last week. Um it seems like we're talking more about Husan Longstreet flipping potentially from A&M to USC than we are about Julian Lewis potentially flipping away from USC, whether that be to Colorado, Indiana, so forth, so on. Um, how serious is this Longstreet USC talk? We wouldn't even be having this conversation if Julian Lewis had shut down his process and mm -hmm. remained locked in with the Trojans. That's USC's top guy at the position. Lincoln Riley and his staff have poured a lot into recruiting Julian Lewis. And we're only here right now because Julian Lewis has entertained Auburn, Indiana, Colorado, Alabama, Georgia, and other programs since he has committed. I think if all is perfect in the world, USC and Julian Lewis – 
uh, USC is able to get Julian Lewis to lock in in the near future. And then I think they shut down their quarterback recruiting elsewhere. But in the meantime, if Julian Lewis, maybe, you know, we've seen this in recruiting so many times, if Julian Lewis ends up heading elsewhere, Hassan Longstreet's a really darn good prospect that uh, they're now building a relationship with. Coach Heward, the offensive coordinator, or excuse me, the quarterback's coach, he's yeah. been talking to Hussan Longstreet since early in the summer. And I think that it wouldn't be surprising to see things pick up with Lincoln Riley and, and Hussan Longstreet if this uh, uh, situation continues to go on with Julian Lewis. So I think over the next week or so, we're we may have some finality on Julian Lewis and USC. If we don't, I could see them really turning it up on Hussan Longstreet moving forward. But right now, I think Hussan Longstreet sticks with Texas A&M. I think mm -hmm. Julian Lewis sticks with USC. But we're just kind of painting a picture that says that we could still have some chaos. I do think the Lewis camp is still reaching out to Auburn, still reaching out to Colorado, still talking to Indiana. But if that gets shut down by next week, I think Hussan Longstreet, that, that goes away. Uh, but right, so right now, I think everything stays status quo, mm -hmm. but there could be some big dominoes that drop as well. All right, a couple of hypotheticals I'm going to throw at you. Does Julian Lewis have the power to shut down Longstreet's recruitment to USC by coming out in the next couple of days, next week, next two, next three weeks, in saying that I am solid with USC? That's where I plan on signing in December. If he were to say that, would USC stop recruiting Longstreet? Absolutely. All right, that presents a little bit more clarity on that situation. Now let's turn our focus to Deuce Knight. Um, break it down. I, I mean, obviously Auburn feels good. The RPM picks are rolling in. But how does Ole Miss feel about this? And what is Notre Dame's status right now? And what are they doing with Deuce Knight? Well, I think I'll answer your last question first. Notre Dame's trying to get this to go into the season. They're trying to beat Texas A&M in the opener and trying to uh, rebuild some momentum with Deuce Knight. Look, Deuce Knight and his family love Notre Dame, what it offers on and off the field. Mike Denbrock's coach, Jaden Daniels, last year, Heisman Trophy winner, the number one offense in the country. I think that's resonated. His relationship with Gino Godalgi, they love Marcus Freeman. But I think right now, he sees himself playing in the SEC. So I think that that would need to, he would have to change his mind back. You know, talking to sources around Deuce and others with knowledge of the recruitment, he's got a very keen eye on being closer to home in the SEC. Auburn is the program that has a lot of the momentum right now. He's built a really good connection with that coaching staff. He was at Big Cat Weekend. Uh, feels comfortable around the players, loves the way that Auburn's recruiting receivers and loves their track record historically at the quarterback position. Now, Ole Miss, they've been trying to flip him for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they're lying in the weeds. They're still in the mix here for Deuce Knight as well. Uh, so Auburn is trying to hold off Ole Miss and keep the momentum with Deuce Knight. Could he commit soon? Does he take it into the season? Notre Dame wants him to take it into the season. I've talked to some people that think he shuts it down before his senior season so he can focus on his last prep year. Uh, but I still, you know, I like where Auburn stands. Mm -hmm. Ole Miss is a dark horse and Notre Dame's just hanging on in my opinion. They are hanging on. I mean, is this a situation where Notre Dame should maybe cut bait because they know a flip is imminent or are they just doing whatever they can, like you said, to take it into the fall? Do you think there's any discussions of, hey, let's cut bait with him? No, nah, you never cut bait. I mean, Deuce Knight's a good kid, a good prospect. They like him. He fits what they're trying to do. Notre Dame's got a talented quarterback room. Deuce Knight brings a skill set that's a little more unique to the guys they have in the room. But if you're Notre Dame, you're also happy about your depth chart. You want a guy like Deuce Knight, the quality of player he is, to come in and push the talented guys that they have in the fold, particularly C.J. Carr. I think you're looking at C.J. Carr right now and saying he's got a great chance to be a three-year starter, but you're recruiting high-caliber prospects behind them that either elevate C.J.'s Carr game or they can beat him out. Well, Deuce Knight has as much talent as any quarterback in this 2025 class. So if you put him in any quarterback room, he's at the very least going to push it. That's what the standard Notre Dame's trying to recruit the position at. But they have C.J. Carr. They've already seen him 
uh, as a tr in spring ball and in fall camp now, and there's a lot of excitement around him. And now you're trying to build great depth behind him and guys mm -hmm. that can push each other. So you hang in there with Deuce Knight. And if you lose him, then you're looking for somebody else. You want to bring in a good quarterback, whether yeah. that's Bear Bachmeyer or someone we're not talking about, like a new Luke Nickel, or who knows what road they go down. It's Notre Dame. They're going to have a chance to play in the college football playoff this year. And, and so I imagine the Irish will have some momentum uh, on the trail this mm -hmm. fall with the way that they're playing on the field. I just don't know if it's going to include Deuce Knight because I think he wants to play in the SEC right now. So I like Auburn, and I'm still keeping an eye on Ole Miss. Mm. We're going to have to wait and see what happens because if Deuce Knight flips, creates a QD, QB domino effect, just like what you said now. Those three names that you named, they're all committed to other programs. So if there's an opening at Notre Dame, what if Hoos and Longstreet opens up? Then a and is going to go flip somebody. So these decisions are not just in a vacuum by themselves. These decisions will impact the rest of the QB dominoes moving forward. You guys let us know. Comment section below. Do you think these guys are going to flip? Do you think it sticks to status quo? Let us know what's going to happen with the QB dominoes. All right, Steve, let's talk David Sanders Jr. You know we can't have a recruiting show without talking David Sanders, and he's set to decide on August 17th. We're under 10 days until his decision. What's the latest on offensive tackle David Sanders? Well, until I hear differently, I'm going to give my best guess for Tennessee right now, but Ohio State and Nebraska – are continuing to battle the Vols here. He's got four finalists. I do not expect him to end up at Georgia as I talk to you right now. So that leaves the Vols, Ohio State, and Nebraska. Tennessee and Ohio State have kind of been the programs we've talked about the most going back to the spring. And Nebraska, they've been rising since they hosted them for an official visit Mother's Day weekend. I think uh, for Ohio State, I think Ryan Day is heavily involved right now. Uh, Justin Fry, his track record. I think they see a lot of potential for David on and off the field at Ohio State, but he's been at Tennessee for every major recruiting weekend this year. He's been to Knoxville five times this calendar year alone. He's been to games there in the past. What Coach Ellerby did with Darnell Wright, I think really stands out to him, turning him into a top 10 pick in the NFL draft. And look, these are three programs that have a lot of resources on and off the field. Uh, so they're in this one here at the end. I like the Vols as I talk to you today, but Ohio State and Nebraska continue to have dialogue with the Sanders camp, and they'll try and say something about that going into his announcement next Saturday. All right, you dropped a new RPM prediction for one of the top players in the state of North Carolina, Jordan Young. He's going to make his decision. He's going to do it here on the On3 Recruit Channel sometime in October. So we're still about two months from his decision, but his recruiting, his recruitment has been heating up. Most recently, we talked about him on this channel because Alabama was getting involved. But you put in a pick, and it's not Alabama. Tell us who it is. No, I like where NC State stands here. And the Wolfpack, they're putting together a sneaky good recruiting class, as they do year in and year out. This is a program that's finished in the top 25 of the final college football poll four years in a row. So they're right there. And Jordan Young is a player that they are legitimately recruiting as a two-way player. And he is one of the most dynamic offensive players in the country. He's averaging over 23 yards per catch over the course of his high school career. He's in the end zone a lot. Then he had eight interceptions as a sophomore. He's been a playmaker on defense he had four scoop and scores uh, as a junior obviously he can impact things as a return man nc state envisions him doing all of that for him on the next level and i think that's exciting for him uh, as he goes into his senior season he's going to commit during the fall and right now uh, talking to sources the buzz favors nc state that's really interesting. We'll see what happens because by the time his commitment rolls around, there's not going to be a whole lot of uncommitted prospects even available. So his value might be sky high by October. So we'll just have to see if that NC State prediction holds up. Uh, Steve, you got a couple of big quick hitters and you want to take us out of here with those? Absolutely, Josh. Let's start with Yose Epinesa, the on three industry five star defensive lineman from Edwardsville, Illinois. He is still trying to make a college decision before his senior season begins. And talking to a source earlier this week, do you think he could be off the board? by next week. Utah is a program that has a great deal of intrigue around it. Miami is another program that I think is very high on the list. And Penn State is a dark horse. He had a terrific official visit to Happy Valley to kick off the summer and loves the way the Nittany Lions get after it defensively. He is an Iowa legacy recruit. His dad played at Iowa. His two older brothers, including AJ, played at Iowa. 
and and so you can't sleep on the Hawkeyes here. But I'm looking more at Utah, Miami, and potentially Penn State for Epinesa. Andrew Marsh uh, on 300 receiver released his top five and his decision date for August 20th. I still like where Michigan stands for him. Took an official visit in the summer, returned for the barbecue at the big house in July. Uh, and, and Michigan, he's been there seven or eight times already. I think that Michigan is the team to beat for Andrew Marsh. That will do it for today's episode of Wilt Fong Whip Around. Thanks for tuning in. Please make sure you hit like and subscribe. Also, please make sure you want to sign up for On3 right now for just $1. Passcode Fong1 will get you just that. But we will be back on Monday with the latest happenings from the recruiting trail. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you guys soon.